Right. So what I wanted to do was really to um, have a discussion with you about what happens when we lo uh, can't speak, no longer debate value. What is value? Who are the wealth creators? What is wealth creation? My view is that so many of the problems that we currently face, for example, inequality, are actually driven by stories and discourses and narratives about value. But it's no longer transparent and it's no longer, again, contested. And in fact, if you look at Piketty's book, which I recommend you do, it's one of the best empirical studies about inequality. And if you look at the period in which inequality started to rise kind of exponentially since the 1970s, he looks at uh, particular changes, for example, to tax regimes that were quite regressive. And what I'm interested in is what are the stories and the lobbying efforts that actually allowed those kind of silly tax policies to be to happen. Value used to be talked about a lot. In fact, the word value was in a lot of economic textbooks. Strangely, um, it's now in a lot of business books, but it's kind of disappeared from economic thinking. In fact, there's one theory of value, but because there's only one, they don't even call it a theory. It's just kind of Econ 101. Whereas if you pick up any business text, they'll talk about value chains and shareholder value and shared value. And so my kind of um, mission is to bring value to the core of how we talk about the economy, also make it much wider than just the economists that make these kind of fancy regressions and equations about it. And so this slide here, which really just kind of looks at the last 400 years, I only have about, uh, what I have, 30 minutes, so 400 years is easy, um, about thinking about value. And basically what I do in the book is I go through kind of three chapters where I look at how value was thought about in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, and then what happened in the 1900s. And basically before, it was often tied to what was happening objectively in the economy. Um, so in the 1700s, which was a period of, um, you know, basically the society was still agricultural, it wasn't surprising that the physiocrats, here I have a picture of one of them, they all look the same. They all look like George Washington and Adam Smith and Francois Canet. They all look like white men with these wigs, but his name was Francois Canet, who did this wonderful Excel sheet and back in the 1700s. <laughs> what he, it literally is the first Excel sheet ever, big data. There was lots of data that he was interested in. But what these guys thought about, they were French, was if value is created in the land, because that's what was happening at the time, um, and if farm labor is basically the source of productive uh, work, if you want, what happens to that production when it starts moving around in the economy? So you can't see this. Actually, I think I've done you a favor here. Oh, look at that. I've turned it into an Excel sheet. So there was the productive class, the farmers. The proprietors were basically the merchants that were kind of selling the stuff. And then the sterile class. This is a wonderful word because it's basically modern banking and modern finance. And the reason he called it, or they called it, the sterile class was literally if the value created by the productive guys and gals was siphoned off, extracted from the economy, the economy would risk no longer being productive or reproductive, hence the word sterility. And so this, this spreadsheet here literally was looking at what happens when um, the value that's produced, then some of it might go to the merchants, and then some might go to these landlords, who they literally saw as kind of the thieves in the system, what would happen if too much of the goods came out. And so they were very interested in almost simulating it, um, not through computers, but through these wonderful uh, tables. Um, <clears throat> and they had this notion of rent, which was also <clears throat> kind of carried over later in the 1800s by the classicals, and the classicals were Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx. And Adam Smith talked about, believe it or not, the free market. What did he mean by the free market? Okay, test, I should give you prizes if you, what did Adam Smith by, mean by the free market? Free from? Regulation and control. Free from regulation and control, but the most classic uh, way to think of it is kind of free from the state, right? Wrong, he meant free from rent. So Adam Smith as well, in his Wealth of Nations, and David Ricardo, and later Karl Marx, really looked at this notion of rent which the physiocrats were really talking about in terms of sterility, and worried about what would happen when the goods in the system, the profits being generated, were siphoned off. And, and, and Marx, of course, had a much more uh, kind of granular way of thinking about that, which I don't have time to go into. But what basically Adam Smith did, um, and, and also David Ricardo, they were living through the 1800s, Adam Smith a bit before that, during the Industrial Revolution. So instead of looking at the fields, in terms of farm labor being the source of uh, value, they looked at factories. And they were very interested in the degree to which profits being earned 
were in fact reinvested to make these factories more productive. So in, in The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith had this wonderful example of the pin factory. These are all different workers and things that you need to make a pin. Um, and he looked at what would happen when there was only one guy making the pins. He could only make maybe 10 pins a day max when there was a division of labor. So the work was distributed between all these different uh, workers, increase in division of labor, increase in productivity, increase in growth, increase in the wealth of nations, title of his book. So the implication was if you weren't reinvesting back into production and kind of around organizational innovation, technological innovation, the system itself would rest, would kind of be inert. There would be no more increases in productivity. Um, and what's also interesting, by the way, is that David Ricardo, back in 1821, he had this chapter called Chapter 31. It's called On Machinery. And he started saying, oh my god, all these machines and this mechanization of production, what is it, you know, what's going to happen to employment and to wages and skills? This probably sounds familiar, right? That's what everyone is talking about today. And they sound like really cool when they talk about robots are going to take our jobs. This guy was already talking about it back in 1821. And what actually happened for 200 years is that even though machines often were labor displacing, that's kind of the technical way to put it, machines came in, industrial revolution, mechanization, many workers that before were doing craft work were no longer needed, as long as the profits in the system were reinvested back in somewhere in the economy, then new jobs and new skills actually appeared. And this is a really, really important point, because in fact, I'll get to this later, but because I'm ill, I might forget, so I'm just going to tell you all the punchlines right away. Um, what actually then happened in the 1800s, sorry, 1800s, 1980, oh, um, was in, that that reinvestment cycle actually stopped. Okay, so I'll get back to that later, but it's really important now just to make those connections. Again, the physiocrats worrying about this value being extracted through the sterile class, putting the system at risk. And already in the 1800s, people worried about the machines taking jobs, but actually as long as things happen as Francois Canet thought in the 1700s, profits were being reinvested back to where value was being created, actually everything was sort of okay. Of course, you still had to have all sorts of struggles and battles, but you didn't have this massive kind of unemployment or uh, you know, a, a dis displacement of labor. So reinvestment, very important. Um, moving on. So what happened was two major things. One, instead of having this attention on objective conditions, and when I say objective, don't think of like deterministic and boring, literally objective, production, machines, tools, different classes, some doing stuff, some just moving stuff around, some literally extracting like the landlords, uh, which again, Adam Smith called thieves. Um, and rent being unearned income. Some people just kind of moving stuff around without actually doing anything. Think of hedge funds, private equity, et cetera. Um, uh, these, so, so this attention also to the land, so objective conditions on the land. Neoclassical economics changed the emphasis to subjective conditions. And by subjective, I mean away from kind of, you know, kind of big theoretical, uh, uh, um, um, how do you say, concepts like land, technology, productivity, to individual preferences. So even wages, which before were seen really as a um, function also of the class struggle itself, which is objective in the sense that it depends on things like workers' bargaining power, they just became a function of workers' preferences for things like uh, uh, um, leisure versus um, work. And consumers were assumed to be maximizing their utility, happiness, uh, companies maximizing their individual profits, and again, workers maximizing these individual decisions. And if you aggregate up all these individual preferences, you get, surprise, surprise, these wonderfully beautiful supply and demand curves, which when they meet, you get equilibrium prices. So the second big revolution is this massive focus on the prices themselves. And in fact, in that sense, prices are revealing value. So whereas before, in the 1700s and 1800s, this focus on objective conditions, meant that they actually began with this fundamental question, what is value? Who's creating it? Who's just moving it around and charging a fee, like a toll just across the bridge? Um, later, the attention became on prices themselves as revealing value, okay? So, and this is huge. It's a huge change. And because we don't teach h economic history and definitely not history of economic thought, many uh, students of economics don't even know this. They don't know that this kind of big revolution happened. Um, and so what I do in the book is kind of ask, who cares? I mean, like how we measure GDP, 
key sources of inequality, what the prices are, in fact, of things like medicines that are actually collectively created, but somehow we just allow the prices to be set in strange ways. So this is what I want to kind of focus on. I want to focus on what happens when also the, the debate itself the, the ability to contest this notion value, to even have the question, who's just moving stuff around? Where is value being produced? What do we need to make sure that uh, the, these profits are being reinvested into what areas, um, as opposed to kind of this siphoning off effect? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.